Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Felix Bongomin. I'm a, a clinician from Uganda who is interested in fungal infections. And I'm going to talk briefly about the use of antifungal agents in pregnancy. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk briefly on the complexity of use of antifungal agents in pregnancy. And I'm also going to explain the physiological changes in pregnancy and the resultant change in pharmacokinetics of antifungal agents that a clinician should always be aware of while prescribing antifungals to pregnant women. I also want to, you to be aware of the teratogenic and embryotoxic effect of antifungal agents and to understand the Food and Drug um, Administration stratification of risk uh, of antifungal agents uh, in pregnancy. As a general rule, what we have to know is that most of the drugs move from maternal to fetal circulation by means of simple uh, diffusion, where the molecules move from uh, high concentration in the maternal uh, circulation to low concentration in the fetal uh, circulation. And that majority of the drugs that are uh, more than 1,500 grams per mole cannot pass through the placental barrier into the fetal circulation. But any drug that has molecular weight of less than 1,500 can then cross from the maternal circulation to the fetal circulation. And we can see that most of the antifungal agents are less than 1,500 uh, grams per mole. In other words, all antifungal agents then have the tendency to move from the maternal to fetal circulation via the placental barrier. And uh, drugs that are not bound to, to proteins are more likely to cross, uh, to cross the placental barrier compared to drugs that are bound to, to, uh, to plasma uh, protein. And that uh, drugs that are more soluble, that are lipid soluble, are likely to, to, to cross into the fetal circulation faster than that, uh, drugs that are uh, water soluble. Let's have a look at the physiological changes that occur during pregnancy. So compared to pre-pregnancy state, during pregnancy, there is an increase in plasma volume up to 30 to 50 percent compared to uh, pre-pregnancy state. And there is also a further increase in um, the cardiac output during pregnancy up to the tune of 30 to 50 percent. And because of that, we know most of the cardiac output actually goes to, goes to the kidneys. And so you get an uh, increase in the renal blood flow up to 50 to 60 percent. And because of the increased uh, renal blood flow, you also get an uh, increase in the glomerular filtration rate. That goes up to 60%. We also have major alteration in the liver enzymes. And we know these liver enzymes, they play a critical role in metabolism of antifungals. Specifically, we have increased activity of 3A4 and 2C9 activity, but there is a decline in the activity of 2C19. And these are the three major um, isoform of uh, the cytochrome enzymes that metabolize the antifungals. And also we have a decrease in the plasma uh, protein content uh, compared to uh, mothers who are not pregnant. And looking at the gastrointestinal uh, tract as well, we have delayed gastric emptying in pregnant mothers because of the muscle relaxation effect of progesterone. Looking at the resulting changes in pharmacokinetics, we see that because of the decreased GI uh, motility, there is increase in drug absorption because the drug takes a lot of time in the gastrointestinal tract, allowing more absorption. And that means more, the antifungal drugs become more bioavailable into the maternal circulation. And uh, because of the reduced protein binding capacity of the maternal serum, uh, proteins, we, we end up with a lot of free drugs within the maternal circulation and that becomes readily available for transfer from the maternal circulation to the fetal circulation. And the 30 to 50 percent increase in uh, plasma volume causes uh, an increased volume of distribution and that means the plasma concentration of the drug is reduced. And we have already seen the alteration in the activity of uh, liver enzymes that occurs during pregnancy. And because of that, uh, there are some drugs that will be highly metabolized and there are some drugs that will be uh, uh, slowly metabolized. 
And because of the increased uh, renal blood flow and glomerular filtration rate, we see that in pregnancy, the rate of elimination of antifungal agents via the kidneys is increased. Then uh, the effect of a, of a drug on the growing fetus basically depends on these four parameters. One is the dose that the mother absorbs and the period of gestation, depending on whether it is within the first trimester of pregnancy, second trimester of pregnancy, or in the third trimester of pregnancy, all will have different effects. And also depends on the exposure time or the duration of therapy. For example, if a mother gets treatment for two weeks, probably the effect might be different from getting antifungal drugs for months. And there are some antifungal agents that actually in themselves, they are not um, active, but the metabolites or the degradation products are more active and they might actually be the one to demonstrate the, the embryotoxic or the uh, teratogenic effect. So all that we have to take into consideration. Then looking at the, uh, at the different uh, periods of gestation, the first two weeks, which we call the pre-implantation period, actually is from the time of conception up to the time before just implantation within the endometrial lining. So if a mother gets antifungal drugs during that period of time, probably there will be no teratogenicity or uh, the, you can only get a miscarriage or what we call spontaneous abortion. But after implantation, especially in the first eight weeks, which we now call period of uh, embryogenesis. That is where the, most of the fetal parts are, are being formed. So, and that is the most critical uh, period where you, we get most of the congenital uh, malformation. Then in the second and third trimester, mainly you, you, you will not get uh, anatomical malformation, but usually you get problems with uh, functionality, you get uh, injuries to fetal organs like the ears, the livers, and uh, placenta, and probably a resulting learning or behavioral abnormalities to the child. So looking at this graph, we demonstrate most of the lethal abnorm abnormalities like the congenital heart diseases or neurotube defects and all the major organ damages. They occur within the first eight weeks of, uh, of gestation. Then. In the later uh, p uh, period of pregnancy, mainly you get minor anatomical malformations, but mostly you get functional abnormalities. So, in other words, for, um, a, a, for a, a clinician who is going to prescribe antifungal agents to pregnant mothers, you should always weigh the risk versus benefit. Of course, the benefit will be to, to cure or to prevent the fungal disease, but the resulting risk will either lead into a fetal loss uh, spontaneous abortion, or congenital malformations, toxicities of major organs, prematurity, and learning or behavioral uh, abnormalities to the child. Then um, there are always a criteria for you to, to firmly say that this congenital or these sets of congenital abnormalities are attributed to a specific drug. And for you to, to say that, you need to meet uh, all the three criteria. One is that the drug must cause a, a specific characteristic sets of malformation. And two is that the exposure must be during a specific window of time. So in other words, does, does the malformation occur within the, the three to eight weeks? And the incidence of malformation should increase with the increased dosage or duration of therapy. So in other words, if you get only a single dose of the drug, and you get a congenital abnormality, that might not be confirmatory. And because of the complexity of defining what a teratogenic agent is, the Food and Drug Administration came with a, a risk uh, stratification for and assigned to the different drugs that can be used in pregnancy. Uh, then we can translate to the different antifungals and see which categories they fall in. Category A drug is actually a drug that has been well studied in a controlled, randomized clinical trial and has shown no risk to the fetus. Then if there are no well uh, controlled studies that have been done in, uh, in human population, but animal studies have shown that there are no risk to the fetus, even in the first trimester of pregnancy, then that drug is put under category B. And if there are no well controlled studies 
in human population, but animal studies have demonstrated a risk of teratogenicity to the fetus, then that drug is put under category C. Category D means there is evidence in human studies of a teratogenic effect of the drug, but the, the benefit of using the drug outweighs the risk that the drug imposes to the fetus. For example, if, if um, uh, a patient has maybe cryptococcal meningitis and she's pregnant, if you don't treat, then the patient dies. So that means the benefit of giving antifungal is life-saving. Category X means a, a controlled studies in both human and animal have demonstrated fetal abnormalities. In other words, the risk of using the drug completely outweighs the benefit of this drug. So the drug is absolutely contraindicated uh, in pregnancy. So translating that into the different antifungal agents, we see that uh, from the polyene classes of uh, antifungal, then amphotericin B falls under uh, category B because the animal studies that have shown no risk if, even in the first trimester. So that means amphotericin B has some level of safety if used in pregnant women even in the first trimester, though we do not have a well-controlled human uh, studies. Nystatin is a, a topical agent and falls under category A. So already well-controlled studies have shown both in animal and human studies that it has no teratogenic effect and so can be used during any time in pregnancy. Then looking at the, at the azoles, ketoconazole and low-dose fluconazole falls under category C. And that means there are no well-controlled studies that have been done in human population, but animal studies have shown risk of adverse events to the fetus. Then high-dose fluconazole, which is used for more severe infections, falls under category D, meaning that it can still be used even in pregnancy because the benefit of using high-dose fluconazole for a specific indication outweighs the risk of its uh, adverse event. Then, uh, just like I've already explained for ketoconazole, itraconazole also falls in category C, and voriconazole is also, because voriconazole, for example, is used for treating invasive aspergillosis. So if a pregnant mother comes with invasive aspergillosis, definitely the benefit of using voriconazole to treat uh, the infection outweighs the risk of uh, the uncertainties of the uh, phytotoxic effect. Then posaconazole, there is no human data, only uh, animal studies. And all topical azoles fall under category C, no well-controlled uh, studies. If you look at the newer antifungal agents, the echinocandines, no human data, no well-controlled studies have been done. But animal studies have demonstrated uh, teratogenic effect that I will explain in the subsequent slides. The other antifungal agents, flucytosine, also falls under category C, Tabinafin under category B, griseofulvin C, and cotrimoxazole. It is not a specific antifungal per se, but it can also be used for treating fungal infections caused by uh, pneumocystis gerovechiae. And that occurs in the settings of HIV, and, and you know the benefit of cotrimoxazole prophylaxis definitely outweighs the risk of uh, adverse events. If you look at the teratogenic profiles of each antifungal, you see that most of them are actually from animal studies or isolated case reports in humans. So ketoconazole, for example, because it has a, a lot of effect on steroidogenesis, it affects mainly sex organ differentiation in, in the fetus. And that has already been demonstrated from animal studies. And fluconazole, mainly craniofacial and rib abnormalities, mainly cleft lip and cleft palate, but also a number of case reports from, uh, from human studies have, have shown uh, congenital abnormalities, mainly tetralogy of fallow and hypoplastic left heart syndrome that are associated to fluconazole therapy. But low dose fluconazole, less than, one, uh, less than 150 milligrams per day, is safe. And uh, just like uh, fluconazole, itraconazole also have the same teratogenic effect, mainly craniofacial and rib abnormalities. Then voriconazole mainly with uh, skeletal abnormalities, but also um, visceral abnormalities like omphalocele um, uh, or gastrochesis have been demonstrated in animal studies. Then 
Posa Kwan has no published human data, but um, from animal studies, there are skeletal malformations and rib abnormalities that are associated to use of Posa Kwan as well. Then, um, looking at the echinocandines, all the three echinocandines, they have different um, uh, teratogenic profiles, and all of them are from animal studies, and that is why they belong to category C. And we can see that with Casper fungin, it is mainly uh, with bone formation and uh, rib malformations. And mica fungin has, uh, is associated with miscarriage and visceral abnormalities and also skeletal abnormalities for anigilla fungin. Then uh, for flucytosin, uh, we know flucytosin antagonizes DNA synthesis and um, it has a lot of effect both on the bone and the bone marrow and uh, also craniofacial malformations reported from abortes, aborted uh, human fetuses. But that occurs only in the first trimester and there are no evidence of adverse uh, outcomes in second and third trimester from limited case reports in human population. Then amphotericin B has no teratogenic uh, effects in rodents or rabbit studies, even in the first trimester. And isolated case reports uh, from clinical studies in human population have shown no fetal abnormalities, even when amphotericin B is used uh, in the first trimester. Then uh, cotrimoxazole, which is actually antibiotic per se, used for treating uh, bacterial and parasitic infection, but we can also use it for treating uh, fungal infection, is well known to be associated with, uh, uh, with neurotube defect, especially uh, spina bifida, but also uh, uh, congenital heart diseases, uh, cleft lips, cleft palate, and, and club foot. So to summarize um, this presentation, uh, we have to note that amphotericin B and all its uh, three other lipid derivatives are considered the cornerstone of treatment um, in any invasive fungal infection during pregnancy because it is safer uh, even in first trimester. Then fluconazole could be considered after first trimester in the absence of an alternative uh, treatment because uh, low dose fluconazole is absolutely safe. Then um, higher dosage is only phytotoxic within the first trimester. So that can be used in the second trimester. Then we should always um, uh, encourage the use of effective contraceptive for all, um, uh, for, for women who are taking uh, itraconazole throughout, uh, throughout their treatment and two months after uh, discontinuation of itraconazole therapy. And there's a strong interaction between itraconazole and the oral contraceptives. So all that should be taken into consideration. And voriconazole is absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy because of our uh, embryo phytotoxic uh, effects that have already been demonstrated in, in animal studies, though we do not have uh, human data. But all that you have to weigh risk versus benefit of giving antifungal agents. Then the superficial infections during uh, pregnancy requires topical treatment and which can be prescribed throughout uh, pregnancy, including the topical azoles, because topical nystatin is uh, category A and the other, the other topical azoles are category C. Then uh, superficial uh, fungal infections like onychomycosis, chromoblastomycosis, and mycetoma should always be treated after delivery because uh, they require agents that might be toxic to the fetus. Thank you.